Hello, everybody out there in pure performance land. Due to summer vacations and many other factors, Andy and I do not have a new show for you this week. Never fear, though, because we've already scheduled some new recordings. We'll have them out to you as soon as possible. In the meantime, we hope you enjoy this encore presentation of How to Build Distributed Resilient Systems with Adrian Hornsby from August 19th, 2019. Andy sounds really funny in this one, so enjoy. It's time for Pure Performance. Get your stopwatches ready. It's time for Pure Performance with Andy Grabner and Brian Wilson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Pure Performance. My name is Brian Wilson, but you didn't know that. And as always, my guest is, can you guess, Andy Grabner. Hey, Andy, how are you doing today? Good, good. Hi, Brian. Thanks for, uh, well, great to, great to be back on actually doing some recordings. I know the audience wouldn't really... No, they have uh, no idea. Yeah, they have no idea. Yeah, they're clueless. To, to they, the... they they think we do it always on like on the two week schedule, uh, but uh, it's been you've been traveling, right? Yes, I went back to New Jersey, visited some friends and family, and got to go to the beach, or as we call it, the shore in New shore. Jersey. Shore mm-hmm. to please. Yeah. Uh, also found out here's a, a stupid little tidbit. Um, so after I don't know if you recall Hurricane Sandy, probably a lot of our listeners overseas never heard of it, but it was this huge hurricane that really did a lot of damage to the whole eastern coast of of the united states but after that you know new jersey was trying to rebuild along the coast and they came up with this saying jersey strong like you know there's a lot of guidos in new jersey like yeah jersey strong we're gonna come back strong and all right and uh turns out somebody opened a gym like a workout gym called jersey strong as well so now it's confusing because if someone has a jersey strong bumper sticker you don't know if they're like, taking pride in rebuilding new jersey or if they're like yeah i go to this gym and lift weights bro you know so that was our, that's my tidbit. That's what I learned on my trip to New Jersey. And you've been uh, running around a lot too, haven't you, Andy? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Well, not running, uh, flying Europe. I did a tour through Poland, uh, a couple of meetups, a uh, couple of, couple of uh, conferences. Also visited our lab up in Gdansk, mm-hmm. which was great. It was the hottest weekend of the year with 36 degrees on the Baltic Sea, which is kind of warm, I would say, but uh, yeah. fortunately, it, you know, the the water was at least you know refreshing still, and yeah, uh, yeah but we're back now, and we have so- uh, sounds like sounds like there's been a lot of chaos. It sounds like there's been a lot of chaos, exactly. <laughs> and actually, I think uh, distance wise, I have Gdansk in Poland, in the north of Poland, is probably not that far away from the hometown of our guests today. And with this, I actually want to toss it over to Adrian, and he should tell us how the summer is up there in Helsinki. Hey, Welcome back, hello. Adrian. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi, Andy. Hi, Brian. How are you? Good. good how are you? Good. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me back. Um, well, the weather in uh, in Finland, since that was the first chaotic question, is uh, indeed chaotic. Um, last year, we had the hottest summer in maybe 50 years, and now we had one of the coldest summer in 50 years, so. Oh. It's, uh, it's pretty weird. Today is nice, actually. So, yeah. so you, so you did not get the extreme heat wave all the way up there, huh? That's interesting. Uh, no heat waves here are twenty five degrees. Okay. Well, yeah, we got. Uh, I think we got forty here in Austria, and uh, thirty five up there in the north of Poland. Crazy, crazy stuff. Hey, uh, Adrian, I'm going to try a quick conversion here. Hold on. Ninety five yeah. to <laughs> south. Cheers. <laughs> Man, when are you finally? Let's see. So yeah. it's about thirty. It's going up to about thirty-five, like all week here. Yeah. Then, wow. It's hot. It's yeah. hot. Yeah. Yeah. When am so, I going to finally get onto the? Yeah, we're never going to do that. That's socialism. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> so, Adrian, Adrian, coming to chaos. We talk about chaos. Uh, well, we, uh, Brian mentioned it. I mentioned it. So today's topic, after having you on the first call, uh, where you, it was really cool to hear about, you know best practices of building, um, you know, modern architectures. I really love this stuff. And I, I used it again, actually, on my trip to Poland. I did a presentation in Warsaw, and uh, I gave you credit on uh, the, the slides that I repurposed for retries, timeouts, uh, back off, uh, chitter. This was really well received. Awesome. So thank, it's great to hear. Yeah, thanks again for that. It, it makes wow. me – it's great when you, when you when you get on stage and people – 
people think you're smart because you told them something new, but it's also great to admit that all the smartness comes from other people that are all sharing the same spirit of sharing and sharing is caring. So thanks for that. Thanks for allowing me to, uh, to share your content. Yeah. I, I don't want to take the credit on, uh, uh, on that either because I, I learned it from someone else, you know, or books or articles uh, yeah. at the end of the day, it's all about sharing, as you said, and uh, teach uh, what we had problem with uh, six months ago. Right. Yeah. Hey, so today's topic is chaos engineering and, um, I, I will definitely post a link to your Medium blog post. I think part one is out and part two is coming. Uh, but it's it's a really great introduction into chaos engineering. And to be quite honest with you, when I I, I never used to, I haven't used the word chaos engineering until recently. I always just said chaos monkeys or chaos testing. And um, and and I think because I was just so influenced by the first time I learned about introducing chaos which was i believe netflix at least when i read about it netflix was the ones that came up with the chaos monkeys is this correct yes correct yeah yeah you know it's all part of the resiliency engineering in a way uh, kind of field right so i think the the, the term chaos uh, chaos monkeys was really made popular by netflix right? and they they're awesome uh, technology blog that uh, talked the story about how they uh, they develop those monkeys, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, and um, so, I mean, again, everybody should read the blog post. It's amazing the background you give, uh, but maybe in your words, can you, when you're introducing somebody into chaos engineering, uh, when you are, you know, teaching at conferences or just, you know, visiting customers and clients and enterprises, uh, what's the, how do you explain chaos monkey or chaos engineering let's call it chaos engineering how to explain the benefit of chaos engineering and what it actually is and why people should do it that's a very good question and uh, i'll try to make it short because i think we could uh, spend hours trying to explain just the discipline of, of chaos engineering but um in short what i say chaos engineering is 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 a sort of scientific experiment right? where we try to identify or especially uh, identify failures that we didn't think of, uh, especially figuring out how uh, how to mitigate them. Um, it's, it's very good at uh, taking the unknown unknown out of uh, of the equation. I think traditionally we've used you know tests uh, to try to test and, and make sure our code is resilient to known condition uh, chaos engineering. It's kind of a take a different approach. Is is trying? It's it's a discipline that really tries to um, to to take things that we might not have thought about uh, out of the out of the the darkness and and bringing it out uh, so that we can learn how to uh, to mitigate those failures before they happen in production. So, mm -hmm. and, and and examples. I think in your blog post you also had like this. Um, uh, I have a graphic in there where you're talking about different different levels or different layers of the architecture where you can basically introduce chaos, right? So it's okay, infrastructure is obviously clear. What else? What yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's very similar to resiliency, right? Uh, I think uh, chaos can be uh, introduced at many different layers uh, from the of, of obvious infrastructure level, you know, like... Uh, uh, removing, for example, uh, an instance or a server and figuring out if the overall system is able to recover from it, uh, from the network and data layer. So uh, removing, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a network connection or uh, degrading the network connection, adding some latency uh, uh, on the network, dropping packets uh, or making a black hole uh, for a particular protocol. Um, that's on the network and data level. On the application level, you can you can just simply uh, add the you know exception, being make the the application throw some exceptions randomly inside the code and see how the uh, outside world or the rest of the system is behaving uh, around it. But you can also uh, apply it at the people level. And uh, I mean, I, I talk a little bit about it in, in the blog. The first experiment I always do is, is trying to identify the technical sound people in teams or the kind of uh, semi-gurus, uh, as I, I like to call them, 
uh, and take them out of the equation and send them home without the laptops and, and see how the company is behaving. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Because very often you'll realize that information is not spread equally around team members. And uh, well, I call that the bus factor. Uh, if, uh, if that very technical, technical sound person is not at work or gets hit by a bus, well, you know, how do we uh, recover from, from failures? Mm -hmm. I, I like that idea. I mean, and Brian, I know we always try to choke a little bit, but I, I think if Adrian would ever come to us, I think he would definitely not send the two of us home because there's more technical sound people in our organization. <laughs> yeah. so it's not necessarily the technically sound people, you know, it's the, the uh, it's very often the connector. It's the person yeah. that knows everyone inside the organization or mm -hmm. in the company that can act very fast or that has basically a, a lot of history inside the company and that mm -hmm. kind of uh, recalls or is, is able to recall every problem that, that happened and how they right. recovered from it. It's kind of a, a walking encyclopedia. You know? Yeah. But Andy, I think you can attest for the fact that I was just on vacation for about a week and a half and the whole company fell apart. Right. So uh, <laughs> I am really, really important to the organization. Uh, before we dive into a lot of this though, one thing I saw in your blog that I think is really, really, really important for people to understand before even entertaining the idea of chaos testing or chaos engineering is you can't just start with chaos engineering. You have to have uh, like prerequisites in your environment. You talked about um, you know all your prerequisites to, to chaos, building a resilient system, resilient software, resilient network. So you really have to, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what, how was, I was reading it, before you start the chaos engineering part, you have to build in as much resiliency into all layers of your system as you can possibly think of first. Mm -hmm. Then you start seeing what did we miss, right? You don't just say, hey, we, we just stood up our application in our infrastructure. Now we're going to throw something at it because, of course, it's going to fail and it's going to be catastrophic. So you really want to start from a good place, right? You Exactly. And, and, and that's the whole point of chaos engineering, right? It's, a, it's really, a, it, I would say, an experiment, scientific experiment where we, you know, we test an hypothesis, right? Um, for example, we believe we've built a resilient system. Right? We spend a lot of time. We say, okay, uh, our system is resilient to uh, database failures. So let's make an hypothesis and say, you know, what happened if my database goes down? And then you take the entire organization, the entire team from the product owner to the designers to the software de uh, developers, and you ask them actually what they think is going to happen. Very often, I ask them not to talk about it, but uh, to write it on the paper, just uh, to avoid the, the kind of mutual uh, uh, agreements, you know, like uh, that everyone comes with a consensus uh, uh, by talking about it. Right? So if you write it on the paper in private, you realize everyone in the team has often very different ideas of what should happen uh, if a database goes down. And, the, you know, good Good place to good good thing to do at that moment is to stop and ask uh, how is that possible that we have different understanding of our uh, specifications. So then you go back into pointing the specification. Uh, very often people fail to read it carefully or improving it. Um, but once you have everyone in the team having a real good understanding of what should happen uh, when a database go down, then you make an experiment and and you actually want to verify that. Uh, through that experiment and with all the measure you're doing uh, uh, around it from, you know, making sure that the system goes back to the initial state. We call that the steady mm -hmm. state of the application. And, and also that it does that in, in the appropriate time, right? In the time you thought about. And you have to verify all this. Yeah, and I think there's a lot to unravel there. But even before that, right, even before you run that first experiment, um, are there, and Andy, I don't know if you've maybe seen any or Adrian, are there some best practices? Like I know there's the, the concept of doing multi-zones. Let's say if we're talking about AWS, you can set up your application in multiple zones. So this way, if one zone has an issue, you still have your two, like, you know, the, the rule of threes. Um, is there, you know, way back, if we go way back in time, Steve Souders wrote the, you know, best practices for uh, web web design, you know, web, yeah. web performance. Um, is there, and I know you've written some articles and all, but is there a good checklist for someone starting out or an organization, you know, before they start these experiments to say, here are some of the starting points that you should set up before you even entertain 
your next set of hypotheses, right? Because obviously if you don't do this basic set, you're going to have catastrophic failures. Is there right. something uh, written out yet or is it mostly just things we've been talking about and word of mouth and people's blogs? Well, it's a very good uh, good question. Actually, uh, I'll take the note and make sure uh, I can <laughs> build go. a list. Actually, that's a very good idea. But I, I would say I think the 12-factor app uh, yeah. kind of uh, patterns are, uh, and, and it's a very good place to start with. Uh, I did put some some list uh, around and I talk about resilient uh, architectures in my in different blogs i think you know the is it's really software engineering basics and you know it's a time out retries exception handling uh these kind of things make sure that you have redundant uh, redundancy built in uh, that your system is self-healing because you know at the end of the day you don't want humans to uh, to recover you want actually the system to recover automatically so that's something that is usually uh, uh, not well thought or not at every level. Um, I always say also, if you don't do infrastructure as code and automatic deployment, maybe don't do chaos or actually don't yeah. do chaos because you're gonna have big problems. Um, you know, your system should should be automatically uh, kind of uh, uh, deployed and managed and self-healed in a way. Um, and then, of course, on the operation level, you should have a full observability and, and complete monitoring of your system, right? If you don't, if you have no visibility on what's happening in your application, there's no way you can conduct a, a sound experiment or even think that I, or verify that that experiment first has been successful or uh, has negatively impacted the, uh, the the running system, right? So, yeah. you know, measure, measure, measure uh, as much as you can. And, of course, you need to have an incident response team in a way or a practice so that, you know, you know what hap- what you should do as soon as an alert comes in and, and uh, you know, and treat the tickets and being able to, uh, to, to, to have this full response, kind of uh, incident response. Yep. Dialed in, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So, and I, and I know Andy's going to want to dive into all this, um, the, the phases. So let's go on. Um, you mentioned kind of an overview of the experiment, the observations, the hypothesis, and all that. So, Andy, I know you probably have twenty thousand questions and things to talk about. So, let's yeah. dive into that now. I mean, I, again, before I actually dive into, because you just mentioned in the end, um, monitoring incident response. I think in your in your blog post, you also mentioned that when you are in, in one of your cases, you inflicted chaos and you actually saw that the incident response or the alerting was also impacted by the chaos. For instance, not able to, let's say, send Slack messages or send emails or stuff like that. I think this is there's such a huge variety of chaos that like your hypothesis is that we need to test against. Yeah, it's very common to to build system that kind of host or power our own response system, and you you see actually that, I mean the, there's been really a recent outage uh, and with, uh, with Cloudflare for example, and you know they were not able to use the internal tool easily right? uh, simply because the, their tools were too secure. Right? Kind of the, the people didn't have didn't use their uh, uh, their maintenance tools and long enough or like recently enough. So the system had just uh, removed the credentials. And when you're in a panic situation, have you seen mm-hmm. systems like this that actually uh, are impacted by your own, uh, your own behavior is, is hard, but DNS is another one. You know, very often if DNS goes down, your own tools are not accessible because they use or might use DNS. So uh, all these kind of things like this, uh, are, are usually very important to uh, to test as well while doing the ex- experiment. Right? That's why you need to start from from or, or simulate the real outage situation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so now I, I got to I got it before going into the phases because I know you have uh, in the blog post you have like five phases that you that you talk about. But I one question that came up while you were earlier talking about application exceptions because. You know, Brian and I, we've been we kind of live and breathe applications uh, because we've been, you know, with Dynatrace, especially we monitor applications and services, but you know, obviously the full stack. But we are very, I think, knowledgeable on applications. And when you said earlier, chaos in applications, like you can, uh, you know, just throw exceptions that you would normally not throw. 
uh, and see how the application behaves. Do you then imply there are tools that would, for instance, use uh, dynamic code injection to force exceptions? Uh, is that the way it works? Or do you just, I don't know, change configuration parameters of the application that you know it will result in, in exceptions? Yeah, there, uh, there are several, several types of tools. Um, there are libraries that you can directly uh, use to inject uh, inject kind of uh, uh, failures. Um, either in Python, very often it's using a decorator function that you wrap around the function and that catches uh, the function and then throws some exception. Actually, I'm building the, the my uh, Chaos Library uh, toolkit for uh, around that uh, using that concept in Python mm -hmm. um, uh, to inject failures in Lambda uh, Lambda functions in mm -hmm. Python. Uh, it's being used as well for uh, for, uh, for for JavaScript uh, similar technique. Uh, there are also techniques to uh, have a, a proxy as well. Um, so you have proxies between uh, two different systems, and then uh, the proxy kind of try or hijack the connection kind of men, men in the middle <laughs> in a way mm -hmm. and uh, kind of uh, alter the connection can add latency can throw some exception can um, inject um, uh, you know like a packet drops or things like this um, so there's a, there's a lot of different uh, technique there's also one very common technique that gremlin is using is uh, using an agent base so they have an agent uh, running on an instance or a Docker container that can inject failure uh, locally, uh, mm -hmm. all these kind of things. Yeah. So they can intercept process level type of things and just uh, throw exceptions or make it uh, make it burst or things like this. Mm -hmm. Cool. So uh, moving on to the to the phases, you know, if you, if you kind of look at your blog posts, um, we already talked about the steady state, right? Steady state, basically, I think for me, what it means, first of all, you have to have a system that is kind of stable and steady, because if you have a system that in itself is not predictable, I guess, in, uh, in enforcing chaos on it is probably then not making it easier to figure out is this a situation now that is normal or caused by chaos. So I guess steady state really means a system that is stable and you know what that state is, right? Yeah, and it's predictable, as you said. Right? Predictable, yeah. I think a, a big mistake what people do is usually they use uh, uh, system attribute metrics, uh, type of uh, CPU memory or, or things like this, right? Uh, and look at this as a, a way to measure the health and the uh, sanity of an application. Uh, actually, a steady state should have nothing to do with this, or at least not entirely, and, and should be a mix of operational metrics and customer experience. Uh, I write in the blog about the, uh, the, the way Amazon does that, is the, the number of orders. Right? And you can ima easily imagine that the CPU on an instance has actually no impact on the number of orders mm -hmm. uh, at, at, at big scale. And similar to similarly for Netflix, they use the number of time people press on the play button globally to uh, to define their steady state. They call that the pulse of Netflix, which mm -hmm. I think is beautiful because it's a relation between the customer and the system, right? If you press several times, uh, then of course it means the system is not responding the way it should, right? So it's experiencing some issues. And similarly, if you can't place an order on Amazon uh, retail page, it means the system is not working as it's designed. So it's a, it's a very good uh, kind of a... A steady state but it's important to to work on that it's not easy actually uh, to to define it and uh, i see a lot of customers having a big trouble first defining the steady states or their steady states you can have several of them mm. but for me i mean the the way you explain it to me it's kind of like a business metric right like orders the pulse i don't know if i would apply it to what we do at dynatrace the number of trial signups or the number of agents that send data to Dynatrace. Uh, I, I, I have a hard time believing, but I'm sure you're right, but I have a hard time believing that companies have a hard time defining that steady state metric because if they don't know what their steady state metric is, they don't even know whether their business is doing all right or is currently impacted. And if, is that really the case? I guess you'd be surprised. Uh, yeah. it's, it's not that they don't know what the business is doing. That sometimes the business might be doing several things, and uh, and uh, you know, it's. Uh, I think 
I think usually the business metrics or, or things like this are are used, let's say, by high, higher level uh, uh, monitoring, mm-hmm. uh, monitoring that might go back to uh, to the managers or the C levels. Mm-hmm. Uh, versus what we want is actually that kind of metric to 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 go down to the engineering team in in a very uh, distilled way and very easy uh, mm-hmm. you know, accessible easily mm-hmm. and and okay that may, now that makes a lot of sense and uh i have another question though so you said cpu is typically not a metric because it doesn't matter how many what cpu usage you have as as long as the system gets back to steady state but do you still include these metrics um the reason why i'm asking is what if you are what if you are having a, let's say, a constant, like the, um, if you look at the orders, right? You have, let's say, 10,000 orders per second coming in, and you know you're using X of CPU uh, in order in, in a steady state environment. Then you're bringing chaos into the system. The system recovers, goes back to the 10,000 10, orders, but all of a sudden you have, I don't know, twice as many CPUs. Isn't that, you shouldn't you still include at least some of the metrics across the stack? To validate not only that you are that the system itself is back in a steady state, but the supporting infrastructure is at least kind of going back to normal, or is this something you would just not do at all because this is not the focus point? No, you're totally right. Uh, you know, the steady state is kind of the one metric that is important, but you do need all the supportive uh, supporting metrics as well, right? It's it doesn't mean when I say the state 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 is the most important one, it doesn't mean you should not include the rest. Mm-hmm. On the contrary, right? It actually you should have as as much metrics as you can. Uh, it doesn't mean you should try to o- overdo the things, right? But I think. Uh, the most essential one, uh, especially, I think, especially for, for, for the cloud is, uh, you know, if you say you have 10,000 orders and your inf- infrastructure to support 10,000 orders is uh, the one that you are currently using, you make a chaos experiment and then that infrastructure is, or the need to support that 10,000 orders is kind of a, a double, then of course you should raise a big alarm, right? Mm-hmm. And and, uh, and make sure that uh, this is looked at, of course. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. So steady state, first first state or uh, first phase uh, of chaos engineering. What what comes next? So after the steady states, we make the hypothesis. Right. Once we understand the system, uh, then we need to make the hypothesis. And this is the what, what if or what when because uh, failure is going to happen. Right. So what what happens when the recommendation engine stops, for example, or what happens when the database fails or, or things like this. So if you're first timer in chaos engineering, yeah, definitely start with a, a, a small hypothesis. You know, don't don't tackle the big uh, the big problems uh, right away. Uh, build your confidence, build your uh, your skills, and and and, and 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 then grow from there. But yeah, this is um, endless possibilities, right? So what I love to do is usually look at an architecture and, uh, and kind of look at the critical systems first. So you you know. Uh, uh, you look at your uh, kind of the APIs and what are the critical system for each of the APIs, and then you tackle first the critical systems, right? Uh, and 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 see if these are really as resilient as you uh, expected, mm-hmm. or if you can uncover some kind of a, a failure mode that you didn't think of, uh, and things like this. And then you can go into less critical uh, dependencies, but usually most important is to make sure that the critical components are are, are tackled first. Mm-hmm. And, and this is also the case with the hypothesis. If I just recount or re- repeat what you said earlier, um, this is also, was it, you explained, you, did, you do the exercise, you, you, you go into a room and you bring everybody in the room and then you discuss the hypothesis and let everyone kind of write down what they believe is going to happen, right? That's exactly. Also- yeah. And this is for me is one of the most important part of that exercise because you want to uncover uh, different understandings and, and making sure that why do people have different understanding uh, from an hypothesis? Mm-hmm. And usually this will uncover some problems already, like a lack of specifications or a lack of communication or simply uh, mm-hmm. uh, people... I've forgotten what it's supposed to be. Yeah. And also, if you think about this, 
you know, let's take the database as an example. If you say, what happens if the database is gone? And maybe one team says, well, my system that is relying on the database is just retrying it later. And then the other team that is responsible for the database maybe says, well, but that's not the intended way. We thought you would just go back to a, like, I don't know, a static version of the data, blah, blah, blah. I think that's, that's as you say, right, uncovering a lot of problems that actually have nothing to do with technology, but actually have to do with lack of communication Absolutely. or lack of understanding of the system. Yeah, yeah and, and uh, very often what I've noticed, the big difference is usually between the design team or UI teams and then the backend teams, right? Uh, mm-hmm. uh, many, many, uh, many times the UI team will have not thought about this. Like what happens mm-hmm. if your database go down? Well, for the technical team, it might be obvious to move into a read-only mode and say, "Okay, we move requests to the uh, to the read replicas of the database," and you know, uh, and eventually after maybe a minute, we fail over the new master. So for one minute, your application will be in a state of, "Hey, there's no database." So <laughs> what do you do? Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. and very often, people in the UI world won't think about it because it's not a case that they were uh, asked for. Right? Read-only mode is quite weird, actually, to to think of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, Andy, I was I was also thinking when reading through these steps and also sitting on the hypothesis and and the steady state piece, how this sounds like this would be a wonderful place for performance testers, engineers, whatever, to transition into. But specifically with this hypothesis phase, I love I I love um, the idea of making this not just for chaos but for performance as well. Let's say there's a, a new release being built, right? Gather everybody together and say, all right, we're going to run certain load against this. What do you all think is going to happen in a way to make them think, mm-hmm. well, wait, what did I just code and what might happen? Like Again, like classic database issue where suddenly we added four more database queries to a statement. Well, mm-hmm. hey, are you thinking about that? But just even if it's not for performance, this idea of getting everybody together to say, what do you think is going to happen if X, whether it be a chaos experiment or performance, you know, some sort of a load test or something else to say, what do you think is going to happen? I think that sort of communication with people opens their mind to actually thinking about what they're doing and what impacts they might have. Mm-hmm. I think Absolutely. regardless if it's for chaos, just, it's, I think it's just a great practice for organizations to, to put together. Well, yeah, exactly. You, yeah. And if you think of it, I mean, the uh, executing load or putting a load on the system is a form of chaos, right? Yes. So, yeah. very cool. Anyway, just wanted to, yeah, it's a, I, I love this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This. yeah. It's great. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, hypothesis is done. Then I guess you run the experiment, right? Correct. And well, this is first designing and running the experiment. And I think here the, the most important thing is is blast radius, right? So you have to uh, keep the customers in mind, right? So, uh, And of course, initially, if it's your first time, you might not want to do that in production and really do this in, in, in test environment and make sure that you are able to control the blast radius during your experiments. And this is very important to, to, to think about. It's like, you know, uh, how many customers might be, uh, might be uh, affected, what functionality is impaired, or uh, if you are a multi-site, which location are going to be is are going to be impacted by uh, this experiment? So, you know, this is very very important uh, to 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 think about. Mm-hmm. And you know, then it's about it's about running it right and uh, identifying also the the metrics that you need to uh, to uh, to measure for that experiment. So, as you mentioned. Earlier, you know, you might want to make sure that you control the number of instances that you need for a particular steady state, and and make sure that you return to that uh, same number after the experiment. And this is definitely part of the overall metrics that you need to 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 check for for your application. Mm-hmm. Uh, from a from a running perspective, I think you mentioned earlier you are writing. You have your Python based library that can run some experiments, then did, did Netflix also release their Chaos Monkey libraries to the world? Or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, the Chaos Monkey was one of the first tool ever released uh, that to do a Chaos, uh, chaos Engineering. Right? Uh, that's now part of a, of a continuous uh, integration tool called Spinnaker, uh, together with the rest of the what they call the Siemen Army. 
and and that's uh, you know there's a, a bunch of uh, of monkeys there's the the chaos monkeys which is the original one which kills randomly instances uh there's a chaos gorilla which uh impair an entire availability zone on in aws mm-hmm. and then there's uh the big gorilla uh, the big kong uh, some gorilla is a uh, chaos kong which mm-hmm. uh, shut down an entire aws region and they practice that in production uh you know if you Maybe uh, once a, once a month or, or something like this, while people are watching Netflix, so just to make sure that their their initial design is still valid, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I wonder what would happen if I wonder what would happen if AWS shut down an entire region. <laughs> 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 Let's not find out. <laughs> you, you'd be surprised, actually. We do. Uh, yeah. I mean, we do chaos engineering as well. Uh, uh, I mean, we started well, yeah. very early on, but. Uh, you know, we don't do uh, chaos engineering on pay uh, on paying customers, yeah. but we do uh, add different uh, level of uh, of chaos engineering, right? Mm-hmm. And and Prime Video does that in production actually. And I'm uh, I'm writing a blog post about that, so it should uh, should be uh, out maybe in a month or two, something like that. Cool. Hey, and then uh, I think you mentioned Gremlin earlier, right? Yeah. One of the uh, agent based companies. Um, so that's also cool. There, so you. Do you have any insights into what they are particularly doing? Um, I mean, as I said, Gremlin is part of the agent base uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, chaos, chaos tool. So they uh, do a lot of uh, uh, cool things uh, on the on this on pair instance level. So they can, you know, corrupt uh, an instance by making a, a CPU run wild. So 100% CPU utilization and see how your application reacts. They can take the memory out they can add big file on the on the drive to uh, to make it run out of a, of a, of a disk space mm-hmm. I and mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, different things uh, state attacks as well like uh, make it terminate or restart or uh, reboot pause all these kind of things mm-hmm. and uh, i mean and the ui is is beautiful to use right i mean the, that's what is called cool. the there's a Another very good framework that I really like is a uh, Chaos Toolkit, um, mm-hmm. and that's more on the API level. So it's kind of a framework, uh, an open framework that you can uh, build extension uh, with. Uh, so there's an AWS extension and that kind of uh, wraps the AWS CLI, and then you can also like do API queries to to get the steady state, do some actions. Uh, probe the system and things like this. And the whole template for the experiment is written in JSON. And mm-hmm. then you can uh, you can integrate that in your CI CD pipeline as well. So, I mean, and actually the Chaos Toolkit does integrate with Gremlin as well. So, I mean, all the tools are, are really um, uh, working together in a way. And uh, I think uh, helping people to make better, better Chaos experiment. Perfect. Cool. Uh, yeah, I think it's always interesting to, the reason why I was asking, you know, people that want to go into chaos engineering, they probably also want to figure out, so how do I inflict chaos other tools out there, there are frameworks out there? Right. And, and that's why I want to ask the question. The proxy level is a very beautiful uh, tool called Toxy Proxy, right? That has been released by Shopify. And mm-hmm. that's like a proxy base uh, kind of a... Uh, Chaos, uh, Chaos tool, which you can put the, that the proxy between your application and, for example, database or Redis or Memcache and uh, disturb, inject some what they call toxics and uh, mm-hmm. inject some latency or do uh, some uh, uh, error, uh, and, like uh, dropping packets, let's say 40% of the time and, and things like this. Mm-hmm. So it's very interesting. Yeah. And then, of course, you have the old uh, old school Linux tools, right? Uh, uh, WRT, or uh, uh, of course, the corrupting the IP tables as well, and things like this. Mm. Or the the old, the very old fashioned pull the plug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's actually uh, how uh, how let's say Jesse Robbins uh, famously uh, did that uh, at right. Amazon on retail uh, in the early 2000s. Right? He would uh, walk around data center and uh, pull plugs from uh, servers and even pull plug of uh, entire data centers. So. Yeah. Cool. That, what, one question about these tools then, because the next part of this is all verifying, right? And you mentioned some th- metrics 
And these aren't host or machine type, type of metrics. These are human metrics, things like time to detect time for notification. Um, do any of these tools that you mention have either the ability to either pick up on like maybe time to notification or allow for entry to, uh, you know, human entry to say, okay, we detected it at X time first, like basically track these reaction metrics uh, that you talk about. Do you know if any of those tools have anything built in or is that something you'd be running on, you know, keeping track of on your own? And then let's talk about what those are as well. Right. So if you look at the Chaos Toolkit, uh, since it's API based, you can query kind of all your uh, system uh, okay. if it supports uh, that to kind of add in the Chaos Engineering re uh, Experiment report. Uh, so mm -hmm. every time you run an experiment, it will uh, print a, a report that you can you can. Uh, you can then analyze. Um, as for the Gremlin, uh, of course, it's more agent-based, uh, so there's no uh, there's no kind of a complete report like this. But uh, I mean, neither Chaos Toolkit or Gremlin type of things uh, have a full full uh, full reporting uh, that you know would satisfy, let's say, uh, the most uh, let's say. Uh, Careful team, like if you want to write a COE, you're going to have to do uh, a lot of human work in figuring out the, all these uh, different things like time to detect, notification, escalation, public notification, self-healing, mm -hmm. recovery until all clear and stable, right? So um, there's nothing yet that really uh, covers everything. So right, it's, right. Uh, there's definitely a space for, uh, for a competitor if you want to build your own company, uh, right? I just, idea. I think there's an idea. <laughs> no, no, well, I, I actually just thought of, you know, obviously on the Dynatrace side, we do the automated problem detection and we have APIs where external tools can feed events to Dynatrace. So, for instance, if you set up the hypothesis, you can tell Dynatrace about the hypothesis, meaning you can say, uh, you can set thresholds on your either business metrics like order rate or you don't know, conversion rates. And you can then also tell Dynatrace, I don't know, Friday, six o'clock, we're starting the chaos time, the, the chaos run. Mm -hmm. And in case Dynatrace detects a problem based on your metric going out of the norm, it would immediately then open up a problem and would collect all the, the evidence, including the event that you sent. So I think in a way we could actually measure a lot of these things and by integrating it even with these chaos tools, we would even allow you to automatically set up your hypothesis and tell Dynatrace about when you started the test run, when this test run was ended, and then Dynatrace can tell you uh, when was the problem detected, when were the notifications sent out, and when was the problem gone, or when did the problem go away. Yeah. So I think we need to... It's a great idea. So, yeah, uh, actually, the Chaos Toolkit supports extension currently for open tracing. So, if it's something that is uh, going to be at, uh, used at Dynatrace, it's definitely something you should uh, look at. It supports Prometheus uh, probes and uh, Monarch CLI, you know, Instana. There's a bunch of, uh, of extensions. So, I think you guys should definitely uh, write an extension for Chaos Toolkit to actually send them the what is called the Chaos Toolkit report. Uh, mm -hmm to Dynatrace to, to add visibility and, and to, to the whole thing. Definitely. It's a very good idea. Yeah. Cool. So learn and verify. Um, what else is there to know? Learn, verify, and then I guess also optimize and, and, and learn and, and fix things, right? Well, you know, the, I think the big part of verifying is also the post-mortem, right? Uh, I mm -hmm. think you should always go through the post-mortem part. And in my opinion, it's the, one of the interesting things, because you're going to deep dive on, 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 on the reasons of the failures, right? If, if they are failures. So if your chaos experiment is successful, then good for you, right? You should also write about this. But if it's unsuccessful and if you've created or uh, uh, resurfaced failures that you didn't think about, as that's uh, the postmortem. And then you have to deep dive really, really well on the, on the topic, and you know, figuring out what happened, the timeline of it, uh, what was the impact, and why did the the, the failure happen? And this is the moment where you kind of want to go to the root cause. I know root cause is 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 something that is very very difficult to to get because in a failure, it's never 
one reason. It's always a collection of small reasons that getting together to create this kind of uh, big failure. But uh, uh, trying to find as many uh, reasons and uh, as possible at different layers, different levels. Uh, and then, of course, what we learned, right? And, and, uh, and how do you prevent uh, that from happening in the future so that how are you going to fix it? Mm-hmm. And those are really hard to... Uh, uh, to, to answer it. They sound easy when I, I talk about it, but it's very, very uh, difficult to, to, to answer carefully all that stuff. In your, in your blog post, you talk a lot about, uh, you, 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 I think you start the blog post actually with comparing uh, chaos engineering with firefighters, because I think Jesse Robbins, he was actually a firefighter, if I kind of remember this correctly, and he brought game day, to to Amazon, right? Yes. Um, and and looking at this, so firefighters, I think you said something like six hundred hours of training, and in general, eighty percent of their time is always training, training, training. Uh, is there, and this might be a strange thought now, but is there a training facility for chaos to learn actually chaos engineering? Is there a a demo environment where you have a, a let's say a reference architecture of a let's say web shop running, and then you can play around with chaos engineering that's and, a, and, and, and yet i think that's called having kids <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yeah. you're totally right i mean one of the very very good point of chaos engineering and even when not done in production or in production i mean in any case is the fact that you can actually practice recovering from failures right so you inject failure in your system and then you let the team handle it the same way as it would be uh, an outage right so uh, you will, you know, uh, practice and practice and develop what the firefighters want to develop, like the intuition for understanding errors and behaviors and failures in general. Like, mm-hmm. you know, if you if you see, for example, an Nginx uh, kind of a CPU consumption curve or a concurrent connection and already all of a sudden it becomes flat, uh, you have to develop the intuition for what it might be, you know, uh, definitely the first thing to to look is uh, is the Linux uh, uh, the security configuration on your instance. Uh, you know, max connection is probably uh, uh, low. All these kind of things, and you can't de- you can't build that intuition if you've never uh, kind of uh, debug the system or trying to recover from an outage because those are extreme conditions. And and I mean, it's exactly that, right? Is practice build intuition and then make those failures uh, uh, come out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Um, is there anything we missed in the phases? I think we are... Fixing it. <laughs> wow, <yeah. laughs> oh, who wants to do that? We don't yeah, that, it's it? like, you know, you've done all the fun right now, so yeah. you have to fix it. And this is, uh, in my opinion, I'll say something very important here is, uh, unfortunately, I see a lot of companies uh, and doing chaos engineering and, and and very brilliant COEs or corrections of error post-mortems, but then the management don't get give them the time to actually fix them the, the, the problem. So I, 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 I've actually was was with one of these companies a few months ago and, and, and two weeks after the chaos experiment, which uh, surfaced some big issues in the infrastructure, they had this real outage in production and we're down 16 hours, right? So... Um, they could have fixed it before, but they didn't. They didn't uh, stop the features, or they didn't prioritize that. And uh, eventually, then they pay a bigger price, right? So mm-hmm. it's very important to just not do those case experiments, but actually to get the management buying and, and make sure that hey, when you have something serious, stop mm-hmm. everything else and just fix it. And that's uh, uh, super important. But but let me ask you, why fix it if you can just reboot the machine and make it work again? Exactly. <laughs> you, you've been using uh, the GVM for, for some time, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like it was, uh, Reboot sorry. Fridays? Is that yeah. what you have as well at exactly. Dynatrace? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Imagine. Uh, so, so besides obviously fixing it, as Andy was going on, um, is there was there anything? Be, you know, obviously, we want to fix it. Uh, beyond that, uh, again, I can't recommend enough to read the blog by everybody. But is there anything that we didn't cover uh, that you want to make sure? Yeah, there's the side effects. I think you know, chaos engineering is great at uncovering failures, but actually, I think the side effects uh, on the companies are even more interesting, and they are mostly cultural, like right? uh, the fact that companies that start to do chaos engineering 
uh, eventually move when successful, <laughs> I've seen non-successful, but most of them are successful, move to what, what I like to call this kind of non-blaming culture uh, and, and, and move away uh, from pointing fingers to, you know, uh, how do we fix that? And, and yeah, I think that's, that's a beautiful place to be, right? Uh, for developers, for, uh, for owners as well. And, uh, because uh, it's a culture that accepts failure, embraces failures, and kind of want to fix things instead of uh, blaming people. And that's also how we work in, uh, at AWS and Amazon. And I really like that. You know, our COEs are, uh, uh, and postmortems are, uh, are kind of blame-free. And that's one very, very important part of, of writing that postmortem. And, you know, I think it's, it's great because if you point someone uh, that is making a, a mistake, mm-hmm. Yeah, eventually it will uh, come back to you, right? And you, you will suffer a mistake one and, and be blamed. And that's never a good place to be. Yeah. I think another good side effect too is going back to the hypothesis phase where people will start thinking probably about what they're going to do uh, in terms of the hypothesis in mind. Uh, bef- so before they actually implement something, they'll probably start thinking more about what its effect might be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a, you think more about the overall system versus your yeah. just the part that you built, right? I think that's a, a, an important thing. And of course, we didn't mention, but very, very good side effect is uh, uh, sleep, right? You uh, you get better, <laughs> more sleep because you fix outages you know, before they happen in production, so uh, you, you get a lot more sleep. Awesome. Hey, Andy, Mm -hmm. would you like to summon the summarator? I would love if you summon the summarator. Do it now. (laughs) All right. Rehearse that one, right? (laughs) (laughs) No, so, well, Adrian, thanks again for for yet another great educational session on a topic. It's, you know, it's a topic, chaos engineering, that I, I would, I would, I think it's still, kind of in its infancy stage when it comes to broader adoption and kind of everybody really understands what it is. I really like a quote that I think you took from, from Adrian Cockcroft, which we, who said, who said, uh, chaos engineering is an experiment to ensure that the impact of failures is mitigated, yeah. which is also a great way of explaining it. I, I really encourage everyone out there read Adrian's blog uh, the five phases for me are, I mean, I think the first two for me are uh, amazing because steady state means you, first of all, need to work on an architecture that is ready for chaos. And you, ne- you need to know what the steady state actually is and have a system that is steady. But then I really like your ex- your kind of, I call it experiments now too, experiment with the people to figure out what they think should happen when a certain condition comes in, like working on your hypotheses because you can fix and find a lot of problems already before you really run your chaos engineering experiments. So uh, thanks thanks for that insight. And uh, I really hope that um, you will come back on another show because I'm sure there's a lot of more things uh, you can tell us uh, that we'd love to. Thanks a lot, Andy and Brian, for having me uh, once more on the show. I really enjoyed oh, it. Really it's nice. an absolute pleasure. I would just like to add one thing as well for anybody who's in like the listening, who might be in the performance or load side of things. Uh, Andy and I have talked uh, many times, especially early on in the podcast, about the idea of leveling up. Um, I'm listening to this bit about chaos. Uh, engineering and all I keep thinking of, wow, that's what a great place to level up to, mm-hmm. uh, or not even level up to. Let's, let's say you're like, oh, I'm kind of done what I feel I can do in the load environment or that whole field. Uh, this is kind of, I feel in the, in the, the continuation of it, it really boils down to hypothesis, experiment analysis. And obviously you have the fixing at the end, um, which is very much the same as, you know, doing your performance and load testing. So, and it's a brand new, you know, chaos uh, engineering is not very widespread yet. Obviously, the big players are doing it. So there's a lot of opportunity out there to get involved with that. So definitely, if I were still on the other side of the fence, you know, not being a pre-sales engineer, I would probably start looking into this a bit more. Um, So 
Yeah, and my, it's my, it's a lovely place. I mean, people are amazing. They love sharing, so I highly recommend everyone to uh, to get involved in uh, yeah in the space. Like so it sounds like it's just a sidestep over to the to a new world of experimentation. Anyway, um, Adrian, thanks again. As Andy said, um, thank welcome you. Welcome back anytime. Anytime you got something new, please come on. It's great stuff you have here. Um, we will put up your information. We're going to put a link to this article, so everyone can go check out um, Spreaker slash Pure Performance or Dynatrace dot com slash Pure Performance. You can get the links. Uh, to the article. If anybody has any questions, comments, you can tweet them at pure underscore DT, or you can send an old-fashioned email to pureperformance at dynatrace.com. Uh, thank you all for listening. Adrian, thank you once again for being on. Andy? Thank you so much, guys. Ciao, ciao, Andy. Thank you. Ciao, Bye-bye. Andy. Thanks. Bye. Bye.